Thank you very much, Dr. Emil. Thank you also to NDU, the Africa Center, for inviting me here today. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be speaking with such an illustrious group. I want to um, try to stick to the time so that I've been told that you're a very active questioning group. So I'd like to try to make my remarks um, as, as tight and concise as I can. Um, what I'd like to do is answer a couple of the questions that were posed to me um, by Chelsea and Dorina as guidance for remarks. And um, as I started to reflect on the questions that they asked us to consider, I found myself um, both drawing on the experience I have had with security sector reform, criminal justice reform, uh, and border security issues in the Maghreb and the Sahel, um, but also finding that as I, as I reflected on the challenges and opportunities in those regions, I found that, that my answers ended up seeming quite universally or broadly applicable. Um, even some of the challenges are ones that we're facing here in the United States. So let me preface my remarks by saying that I actually regard many of the things I'm about to say as by no means limited to the African continent or the Sahara Sahel region, um, but rather observations um, that can be seen on a spectrum of, of more most challenging to more weak and less challenging, and that each country is somewhere on the spectrum uh, in terms of how it has to think about and address these threats. Uh, and in that sense, I leave it to you to think about where your country might be on the spectrum of difficulty of challenge posed by um, some of the issues I'll raise. So I identified eight main challenges to state building in the Sahel Sahara region and more broadly and I'll share them with you now. Um, for me, um, and this is certainly most, most applicable from the work I've been doing and seeing in Tunisia, but I would say that it is also somewhere on the spectrum for many countries, transitioning into inclusive governance patterns. And for more established democracies, maintaining those inclusive government, governance patterns, um, whether that reflects a full dem democratic system or not, um, these inclusive governance patterns are difficult to establish and maintain. Um, they often challenge entrenched interests. Um, citizens want to feel more represented. They want to feel more included. And you can certainly see that if you've been here long enough to pay attention to the American election. There's a lot of electorate anger uh, in America today, but not a lot of awareness or understanding about how to get involved other than voting for a candidate. Um, but there are other ways to involve active, electing, uh, active members of the population. Um, and it's important to think of mechanisms that are more inclusive and do allow a broader reach uh, of members of the, the citizenry to be involved. A big part of that would be education. But I'm as committed as I personally feel about the education of, of citizens as an issue uh, and as involved as I am in that, um, I'm going to leave that to the side for a moment and simply flag education as a core issue. Um, another key challenge I would identify is corruption. Sometimes so entrenched that it's not even acknowledged or recognized as corruption. It's simply the way business is done. Um, so there's a spectrum from small fees that actually do cover costs and could fairly easily be incorporated and, and legalized um, without uh, too much of a hiccup um, to really massive accumulation of wealth at the state level um, and, and also involving in the middle somewhere non-competition. Um, favoritism and selective um, treatment by certain um, parties who always get government funds to do various activities. And so it's important to see corruption as actually um, a, a challenge to stability. It's a, it's a transnational issue, it's a state building issue, and, and all of the things that I'm about to identify, I would also say are 
cannot be separated out. You cannot say, well, we're gonna work on the inclusive governance, but not the corruption, or vice versa. Um, these all need to, to mesh together to create a strong fabric. It's woven. Third, um, the relationship of the government with the press, um, and particularly attention paid to a desire to control the press. Um, sometimes that's a valid desire to make sure that the press is functioning responsibly, because of course um, media responsive responsibility is quite important. Uh, there are very dangerous things that can happen when a media uh, is not careful or well trained, uh, or or. Um, can exacerbate hatred or feelings or conflicts um, and can really make situations worse in an irresponsible way. So that's, that's an issue that deserves some real attention. But um, I think it's um, the relationship of governments with, with media, with press, um, and all forms of media is a key indicator of the health uh, of the government and the structure in the system. Not just the sitting regime, but the whole government setup of institutions in a country. Um, I would argue that efforts to overly control the press actually backfire much more um, than they help. And um, it's, they become either standing jokes that the media is always reflecting what the government wants people to hear, or um, they, they end up backfiring in the sense that the message is so firmly um, entrenched that any shifts of policy become more difficult for that government. Um, I would argue that free press doesn't mean good press. That's a process. We certainly see that in the Western world, that there are many outlets and sources of, of information and media that produce terrible, terrible things, products that are false or exaggerated or misleading, um, but that nonetheless, in attention to developing a proper role for media so that it can actually be useful, it can get good information across, it can actually serve as a public awareness raising mechanism, um, and it can actually be the government's friend um, and, and the friend of transitions and the friend of approaches to dealing with security challenges and state building challenges. Um, I think that this is, it's a really core challenge uh, for the region. Another one I'm going to identify of my eight is, um, and this is where I get a little bit nerdy and a little bit more academic. Um, this, this is an idea that I feel quite strongly about and it, it doesn't always make sense at first, but um, this is the loss of the political. And what I mean when I say that is that most people um, have decided that politics is terrible and we just need good governance and we don't need politics because politics is all the bad activities that politicians do and we don't like it and we need to get rid of politics. That's very much a refrain in the United States, you may have noticed during your stay. But in fact, from a political science point of view, the political exactly is exactly what we need to bring back. What we're seeing in dysfunctional governance communication mechanisms is the, the absence of the political, because from a political science perspective, what the political really means is, it means the nonviolent management of disagreement. It means negotiation. It means compromise. It means talking with your opponents and all of you agreeing that you're on the same side trying to make uh, a better country, trying to arrive at the best solutions for governing, um, having different points of view, but negotiating those different points of view to come up with a solution. That's politics, we need that. And we need not to defame what politics is, we need to bring it back and celebrate it. And that's a challenge for everyone. And, and it is, I think, suffering from the explosion of our ability to communicate with each other has allowed us to come together in surprising ways and has allowed us to have conflict in surprising ways. So it's, it's pulled us together and it's driven us apart. And po the political has suffered in that process. I also want to point out um, the effects that social trauma can have as a result of violence and perpetual insecurity and uncertainty. 
Even in countries that haven't seen war or conflict for many years, um, if there is perpetuated political uncertainty um, or some threats of insecurity or, or violence, whether they are uh, realized or not, um, that plays into the social ties, the social contract, the, the trust of a society and makes it more difficult um, to, to do the things that governments and citizens need to do, um, more difficult to have the political back because you need that trust. Um, so I think that paying attention to the effects of social trauma, political trauma on a society to, be, to, to recognize it, to take it seriously. I've seen in my travels across the continent um, and even starting to notice it and recognize it in my own country now, um, the effects of these protracted disagreements or conflicts or instability, um, uncertainty, can make a society brittle or polarized, and that's difficult um, to do the, the work of state building and to deal with threats or challenges uh, when your society is brittle, doesn't have the trust, doesn't deal with these challenges in uh, a kind of take it in stride way that we often refer to as resilience. Um, security and justice institutions that were developed from a perspective of protecting a regime or a system more than the people. This is a pretty significant issue for all of you, I'm sure. Um, there is a very important uh, distinction to be made when you're thinking about what the proper role of a security institution needs to be. Um, clearly, there is a desire for order and law and justice and for rules to be followed and that's quite necessary for stability. Um, there is also a necessity for particularly the police and the civilian services who are, are facing and meeting the public on a much more frequent and intimate basis than the military forces. Um, but in some cases, of course, the military play this role as well. Um, they are the face of the government. They are the contact that the citizens have with their state. If they aren't themselves trained and they aren't themselves viewing their role, as one of service and protection of the very citizens that they are themselves immersed in, then there will be an unhealthy and unproductive relationship and an, a very difficult road to providing security in the society, I would argue. Um, partly because it's very necessary for citizens to be able to trust their security forces. They need to be able to, to feel that it's safe to tell them that there are threats that they're observing in their communities. And partly because when citizens are um, experiencing extended um, feelings of an unfair um, offering, an unfair uh, provision of security, if there's too much security and not enough um, rights respecting and not enough protection, um, then there will be a cost-benefit analysis done by the citizens uh, that will perhaps not actually provide the stability in the community and the, the, the prolonged peace uh, that will be required. And again, we're certainly seeing this in the United States. No country uh, can sit back and say, we're done, we're finished, um, particularly as, as roles and conditions for policing um, emerge and respond to new technologies and new threats. Uh, the police need to change their training, they need to change their approaches, they need to, to recognize and correct uh, some of the ways in which they're handling these threats. And uh, as you, you can see, if you're reading the news and paying attention to what's happening in the United States at the moment, there's what I would describe as a crisis in policing in the United States today. Uh, and it's the, the best news about it is that people are actually taking it seriously, I would argue. Um, this is something that's uh, particularly relevant, I think, to, to North Africa, um, and that would be porous borders. Um, border security management, the management of smuggling, um, but of course it's, it's a problem for, throughout much of the region we're dealing with in this session. Um, keeping borders closed, is, is not a long-term solution 
Um, border communities and, and economies need trade. They need movement across uh, the border to, to be sustainable. Um, so it's, it's extremely difficult to, to manage borders. Uh, and of course, the failure of some of the states on the continent has made managing borders particularly difficult. Um, and for, for this region, of course, Libya stands out, but, but so do others. Um, we have done some work with border, uh, border security officials in the Maghreb, as well as in the Sahel. And I'm pleased, I'm so pleased to report that my experience with them has been extremely positive. Um, they are facing very challenging circumstances and they are very seriously considering what they need to do to have good relations with the communities. They have acknowledged that they need working relationships, they need an um, inside the community approach uh, to, to being able to provide real border security and to have a good idea about which illicit crossings are livelihood support and which illicit crossings are really going to lead to some very significant dangerous criminal activity. Um, so these, this is a really important question facing the region. And again, I don't wanna take up too much more time. So my final challenge that I wanna mention here is, and it's related uh, to the porous borders question, is economic sector weakness. So poor economies, um, these we saw were one of the significant drivers of the Arab Spring movements across the region. Um, and, and you could almost say that, that citizens can take quite a lot of, they can take physical insecurity, they can take uncertainty in weak institutions, they can take uh, abusive treatment by security forces and regimes, but when they can't buy bread, that's pretty much the last straw. You could say that economies are the linchpin for whether or not a country is gonna see stability. I mean, I would argue that they're not the one thing that should be dealt with, um, but that they are something very important as an indicator um, into whether the many, many challenges that are facing you here today are being dealt with properly. I know that there's a big, um, there's a tendency that um, outside actors, international actors, focus on development and economic sectors because we're pretty good at that. I've also noticed though that economic aid has a, has a sneaky way of aiding the giver as much as the receiver. Um, a lot of that money comes right back in, uh, in the form of paid consultancies and you know, trade that you know, benefits the, the donor. Um, and that doesn't mean it's a terrible idea, it just means that I think it's important to pay attention to the economies of states facing challenges as, again, as I said, threads that need to be woven into the whole the whole cloth, not as the one thing that's gonna fix the problems or the challenges. Um, I see them as all very closely knitted together. Now I do have a list of um, ways to address these challenges, um, but I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep that in my pocket and use it to answer questions, and I look forward to talking with you further. Thank you.